first of all, um, thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you also SAP. I have a lot of respect for your organization. I'm not being paid to say that. Palais for the Oceans started itself pretty much uh, 10 years, 11 years ago, uh, when I met um, a guy, and that was an activist. And I met him by total accident um, at an art show, at an art exhibition, a Bayerle Foundation in Switzerland. And um, a friend of his was there to bring bail money to Germany because he was jailed in Germany. And there was Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd. I met him a day later, um, June 16, 2012. And that day, I called home to New York um, after I met him, actually in the middle of the meeting. And I spoke to my partner, Leah, and we decided to stop being a design firm. Because it didn't make any sense anymore, because we realized that day that the oceans will die and we humans are responsible for it. And that's not something that we can accept. And the fact that we would not know about that, that we need a pirate to tell us, um, freaked us out a bit. And we're like, my god, what is going on? We're sitting here totally like focusing on our own ego and making money on living in a great city and winning awards. And actually it's us who are destroying the planet and destroying the sea. And I felt very comfortable with the idea of uh, blaming myself because then you actually can do something. It's very empowering to, to see the problems I caused by you. And the creative class is actually at a very high extent, responsible for the issues we are facing today. Because we're guns for hire. We do pretty much everything for a client. I mean, yeah, we discuss about colors, and we, we, we are tough in meetings and creative and all that stuff, but we don't really say, okay, you know what, um, Adidas or whatever brand, screw you. I'm not working for you if you're not going the right direction. No, the opposite, actually. We do whatever we can to win their accounts and to keep them. So that ended June 16, 2012. That ended for me and Leah. And we started Palais for the Oceans. And pretty much all our staff left. They thought we were crazy. And we had no plan. We had no concept. But we knew that we have to do something. And the idea was to make peace. The idea was to actually push the creative community into the center of a revolution, of an urgently needed revolution, a material revolution. And the idea was to say, we will not be part of the killing. We will not be part of destroying this blue, magnificent planet that we are on. We're going to do everything we can with everything we have to end it. We're going to end, in our lives at least, um, the service for destructive economy. That was the birth hour of Palais for the Oceans. Palais means a negotiation of peace. Uh, in our, uh, in our uh, little Palais universe, it's uh, making peace between life out there, non-human life, and us humans. And the causes that we were signing up for back then were biodiversity loss, mainly over overfishing. We started with shark finning and things like that. It was very complicated to get that into the mass media, very, very complicated to get people to support us and to even feel something for these animals. Speaking about empathy, I mean, who feels for a fish? Who feels for an animal that looks at you that can't express in a human language what pain it suffers because you are doing an absent mind, pouring something in the water, or eating something, or just broke up their family by killing half of them off, or killing them without even knowing it because it's a bycatch. So that was very hard for us. So we are still doing a lot in the field of overfishing, illegal fishing, biodiversity loss, but it was not attractive for the masses. Then we looked at climate change. Very complicated to communicate again. It's very removed from everyday lives. It's very removed from people living in cities like New York or going to places like some Morris, some Bart or um, Berlin or whatever. So also hard. And also, nobody felt responsible for it. It feels like so far and so big of an issue. That brought us to plastic pollution. Actually, it was a little trailer. Uh, Chris Jordan made it in mid, uh, um, Midway out there. Um, he funded later his film, Albatross. 
Um, and it showed albatrosses, babies growing up, um, being fed by their parents with plastic trash because they mistake that trash as food because they're flying over um, these vast scapes of ocean and they're grabbing whatever they think is food and often and mainly actually, it's trash, it's plastic trash. They go home and feed their trusting children plastic trash. And he was able to capture that on film. So plastic pollution had this enormous quality for us to be visible, to be also relevant for all humans living on that planet because plastic is like this universal language, a beautiful one, one that we learn to trust in, colors out of a Pantone uh, book. Uh, for a designer, a dream, a fantastic material. We can do whatever we want with it. You know, it, it obeys. It does whatever we ask for. But then um, we realized very quickly that our approach was wrong because we thought at the beginning we could have gatherings like this, um, of course not as amazing, um, more like at the home of an artist like Julian Schnabel, having pr like figures from the art world, entertainment, politics, people who own a lot, bring them all in a room, and our first palais had like, a, I think, 10 billion net worth in the room. Back then we thought that's a lot of money, we learned that's not, after people can now buy uh, Twitter and stuff. Um, so we were like, oh my God, we made it. You know, we have all these people here, like the number one expert of the uh, Obama um, administration for counterterrorism, um, Eric Schmidt from Google, uh, actors, and you name it. And we're like, my God, all these amazing people, we're gonna change the world. Great event, uh, a week later. Actually, everybody, we only serve vegan food. Um, they all disappeared then in like a spotted pig, which, which is like a carnival place, a celebration of meat eaters. Um, and, or they went to, to N, a uh, Japanese brasserie afterwards, because they had vegan food and they were still hungry. You know, what can they do? So we learned that this will not really be our tool here for change. You know, we're like, this is an event format, that's like a mini version of TED, you know, and we couldn't... So we, we stopped focusing only on talks and we said we need a cause, we need to do something. So we went from the home of an artist, um, some events that we host at the UN, to uh, Pasadena, right, to uh, JBL, because we thought, hey, these guys, they can fix problems, you know, they know what it means to actually depend on something on good science, what it means to come with solutions in the moment where it's needed and not wait five or 10 or 20 years. Imagine they had a problem with a mass rover and they would say, oh, by 2050, we're gonna fix that. Um, so that's not really working for them, right? So we went to JBL and we learned that the space industry actually, that the astronauts and the people who are working in space are pretty much all of them environmentalists because they're going out there into space and looking for planets of course, they're looking for Earth, it applicates. Uh, they're looking for water, they're looking for life, and they're looking back, and they're seeing a fantastic planet, and they're like, why would we not just protect this one also, you know, before we are looking for something else? What I find very comforting right now is that there's fear everywhere. I think that's great, right? You go to any country in the world, you speak to a fisherman, you speak to a president, you speak to a family who owns the, pres uh, the, the companies in that, <laughs> in that country, and you see that they're not anymore feeling like, okay, I can survive in a gated community or my boat or somewhere. It's like, there's fear. Like, there's this underlying level of fear, which is fantastic, right? On one side, it helps people that we don't want to have in power to come to power, but on the other side, it is, there's, a, there's, a, there's something growing. And I think fear is an energy that you can easily direct in a di other direction. And that is optimism, that is vision, that's, and that can be done by ideas, that can be done by innovation, that can be done with an optimistic approach. And I find this whole like uh, angle of like, oh my God, the world is dying and everything is so bad. That's not really helping here, right? Yes, we know that by now. We don't need more awareness, I think. At least not the people that can really change something. At this point in time, we need to get to work. And nothing is more inspiring than an idea. And an idea brought into action. A successful idea. And, and that is pretty much what we try at Palais to do, is to help others to be extremely successful in defining a new economy again. A new economy that is based on innovation, is based on collaboration, that is based on empathy.
that is based on a new idea of leadership, which is actually not defined by cruelty. Because today a CEO is cool if he's cruel. He gets hammered by his board members, and his, by his investors, or hammers everybody else. It's a very negative spiral, right? So why not be creative about it? So we believe that the future and the solution for all the problems we are facing is in a culture of collaboration between us humans, but also between us humans and nature. And that's new, because most of us still think nature, these are things, right? We don't even see them as people. But actually, technically, these are people, these are creatures, organisms that allow us to be here. So the past being fear, old technology, culture of exploitation, we learned that. That's kind of the past with 8 billion people living here. And the future at Palais is this beautiful thing that we're creating, a new economy based on vision, based on new technology, based on a culture of collaboration. Very simple. In 2012, at the United Nations headquarters, June 8, um, we felt that we had to declare a material revolution. And I grew up in the time that you would describe today as the digital revolution. And I grew up in the wrong country. Otherwise, I would be hopefully also now like a Google or somebody like that. I grew up in Germany. They didn't really believe in it. So they're like, oh, this is a trend. This will pass over. Um, so the digital revolution and the material revolution, they're quite similar because they're industrial revolutions. And I would predict that in a 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years from now, a company that is producing toxic and harmful products is out of business or has very hard, a very hard, or is in the weapons industry, um, or has a very hard time to be loved by clients and be supported with strong purchases by, um, by consumers or citizens or people, humans, right? Users. So our role at Palais is because when you're looking at all the environmental uh, issues that we are facing, you come down to economy all the time. And I'm actually pro-economy. I'm, I'm not believing that in, in any other system. I believe in capitalism, right? And it's uh, how I mold it. That's what I know. It works very well for me. And I think we can't change it so far anyways, because humans are pr pretty selfish and competitive. So we at Palais believe that our mission is to rapidly transform economy. And we do that by picking companies and getting them to perform quite radical actions and be successful with it. Make more money with it. Make it more lucrative to protect the oceans, climate and life, than to destroy it. That's our approach. And it comes pretty much from the times when I started where we tried to make sneakers sexy or jeans or whatever. It's the same thing. If something is cool, everybody wants to do it. So that's what we believe in, in the more irrational aspect of things. That's why we work with art, that's why we work with fashion, with sports, entertainment, because we, we want to trigger this moment where we humans stop thinking rational and just do and follow our instinct and doing the right things because we know they're right, instead of asking for a next research and a next study. I, I can't hear it anymore. I can't hear anymore we need another study. Honestly, try and test it out. If you can ban plastic in your country, try it. If it works, fantastic. If it doesn't, we adjust, you know? But there is now, we need to actually just do things, learn, because that's how innovation works. It's never perfect. So, and we, we, we really bid on creativity and collaboration, and we don't call it sustainability because it's a lame word. Uh, we call it eco-innovation, really. And it starts with this AAA moment where you're saying, oh, I'm an addict. It's very liberating. You know, like, hey, I have a bottling company. I sell sugar, water, and plastic bottles. That's shit. <laughs> you know, whoa, yeah, that's bad. I'm, I really feel guilty for that. It's nothing good about that. And yes, my toothpaste is actually bad for coral reefs because there are chemicals in there that are really, really bad. And my sunscreen is bad for coral reefs. And you know what? If you swallow that stuff, it's also bad for your human. So, I mean, try to swallow a toothpaste package. I mean, just put it all in your mouth and swallow it. You know, probably you can make some bubbles, but it's definitely not that you're going to feel healthy afterwards. Just, I don't need a study for that, okay? So plastic is a design failure. It's just accepted. And so as a designer, you know, we don't, we, we don't really have a problem emitting mistakes. I mean, you pick a wrong color, it's bad. Your, your logo is out there that you do it again. 
taking something apart what you created and questioning it and doing it again is totally normal. Otherwise, there would not be a good process. So at some point, we have to say, some things is great, are great, some are bad. And plastic, I can tell you, is bad. Out of reasons Sean already told you about, so that's great. When, when we have the stage together, I now don't have to go back to that. It's just unhealthy for everybody. And it looks really bad when you're in nature at the end of the world, in a remote island, and there's this belt of trash around it, and the refrigerator and whatever else. Um, it all washes in. It's just bad. Plastic, out of a thousand reasons, and you can ask JetGPT4, is really, really bad, okay? That also makes my talks a little shorter, by the way. But on the other hand, I am standing in front of you with a nylon jacket, which, yeah, is plastic, <laughs> and it has a poly filling, which is polyester. Some people don't know it, but it's also plastic. And my pants stretch a little bit, so yeah, there's plastic in there. My shoes, for sure, plastic. Yeah, more stuff that is plastic in my life, right? So. We are addicted to it. Right now, we couldn't be in this room, we couldn't travel here, we couldn't have, honestly, we, there would be very little we could do without adding to the global plastic footprint. That means saying, I go plastic free today, me as a person, is nearly impossible. But I can start somewhere and can say, oh, I can avoid it here. I can avoid it here. There are lots of ways to totally avoid plastic or to at least reduce it. And that often has a campaign effect on other people because they see you with your ugly uh, refill bottle or your beautiful one, and they're like, why is he walking around with a San Pellegrino bottle? Because is that because of the plastic bottles out there? Or why is that, right? Or I'm not saying bottled water is great, but it's a step. So I think perfect is in the way of, the, of innovation here totally. So we just do the best we can to avoid it, and it's often a conversational item to do that. The second, though, is recycling that is being attacked like mad right now by environmentalists because they're seeing it as greenwashing. Recycling is fantastic. Recycle, 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 recycle. I'm not following the trend of other people that's saying recycling is bad. Recycling is fantastic. Plastic is shit. Plastic is bad. Recycling is amazing. And right now, if we tell people recycling plastic is bad, what should they do? They will not stop using plastic. They will go back to Virgin and will say, why would on earth would I as a company pay double the price, or if you work with Palais, five times the price uh, for that plastic, if I can have the original, because recycling is anyways conceived as greenwashing? Hmm. Hmm, let me think. Spend a lot of money for no impact, no soft impact. Nobody likes me for that. Oh, let's go back to version. Why is recycling amazing? Because it ends the addiction to virgin plastic. It interrupts the business model of the plastic industry slash oil industry. Plastic is a nightmare. A recycling concept that actually works is the nightmare of the plastic industry. It was never designed, never supported, and all projects that I know from a Coca-Cola and other guys, Pepsi and whoever, that actually worked, where people brought the bottles back and got money, were stopped. Because they don't want that plastic back. They don't want it. They just want to do whatever they do and tell the regulators, oh my God, recycling is the solution, but probably we do a little of that, and oh, people don't want to do it, and they don't want new materials. There are so many excuses to do nothing, we should not add to that. There's no excuse today to not use recycled plastic. And the better, of course, is not to use plastic at all. But if you use it, at least go recycled. And don't use some of these materials like PVC. There's no reason to use that anymore. At least that's how we see it. And recycling and the dependency on plastic with 8 billion people on the planet will hold for a moment. Yes, in New York City, we can replace a lot of plastic items in a fancy way. They come plastic wrapped, and the retail store will take the wrapping off, and then you will buy the paper bag. You will not see the plastic, but it will still be there. And we will have plastic for the next 10, 15 years, probably 20 years. And in the meantime, we need to invent new materials. We need to replace plastic. Plastic needs to be phased out, for sure but then we need to recycle these new materials. That means we're gonna need recycling, otherwise we're just wasting resources. Palais is now today structured into two, or actually three different areas. 
One is called Paleocean Defense. And this is all about protecting life out there. Go out there, help animals. Do whatever you can today. And we're operating in 34 countries. Some countries have one person <laughs> running Palais there. Others have hundreds. Others have like full government support and, and big networks. Um, ocean defense on one side means intercepting pollutants. And we're going to speak material today, so I want to speak about this. But there's also other parts that we work in. There's like, uh, uh, illegal fishing, poaching, slavery. There are a lot of topics we work on. Um, but pollutants are a big one. And plastic being the most prominent one because, of course, there's other stuff, agriculture runoffs, uh, other chemicals. There's lots of pollutants that we created so proudly over the last decades. And what we did is we turned these pollutants into premium material, into recycled premium materials to replace virgin plastic or virgin materials in the first place. Um, we do that by adding a very big premium price on these materials because that funds big parts of, oper of our operation. I mean, you're looking at the activities that we're having. Plastic is one, electronic waste is another, and new to our, new to our uh, focus is now also carbon dioxide. Yes, it's the same thing in a way. You're taking a pollutant, carbon dioxide being actually a very good substance. That's the difference between carbon dioxide and plastic. Plastic itself is very toxic and harmful. It's not getting better by being recycled. The carbon dioxide is actually technically an amazing, amazing um, raw material. Yeah, a whole, all life on planet Earth is carbon-based. So taking these materials, these substances, out of nature, out of places where they don't belong, and recycling them into all kinds of application, that's what we do at Ocean Defense. Um, and we do that in a community-based way. That means the act of intercepting, the act of avoiding something, the act of like, doing something yourself as a citizen, consumer, human, um, is very educational and empowering. So having people out there in communities, working in the framework, being fully educated, having career opportunities, making solid money, not being exploited, intercepting stuff, and delivering that to the next chapter that recycles it, that's the part where we are extremely strong, uh, especially in Asia. And then turning these materials into yarn, into injection pellets, whatever you need to make a product. And you might have seen Dior, Adidas, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a step. That's a one big step. I mean, you saw uh, Adidas moving now to 96% recycled material away from virgin material. This not ha didn't happen unnoticed. And this didn't happen without a fight. We had to work on this seven years. And Actually, that's when the contract started. We started working at Adidas 10 years ago. We, it took us two and a half years to sign a contract with them. And they committed to go out of virgin material, virgin plastic. And they committed to actually invest into alternative materials. But we were able to show them that this is good business for them. Uh, Adidas is making $2.5 billion a year with Palais product. So suddenly, yeah, this is business. And they are seeing that, especially young demographics, buying into that product. So they're seeing, oh my god, and we did the same with Dior, the Dior product is actually 30% more expensive when they're doing it with us, because it's a fully transparent su supply chain, which costs money, especially with small volumes, which they have. And they sold it even for 30% more. And they sell faster than other stuff. So we wanted to make the point that there is demand. And we wanted to make the point that there is business and it's worth investing in, even if it costs you half a billion dollars or a billion or 10 billion, whatever it costs you, there is a case to make. And we don't want to back for doing that. We want to actually say, listen, if you're not converting, if you're not transforming as a company, as a government, you're running out of business. You're outdated, you're old economy. Because new economy will be non-toxic in 15 to 20 years. Yes, recycling is still not the solution, especially with plastic, and plastic stays toxic. I want to actually stress that point when you're recycling it. You can strip away some chemicals if you're doing depolarization, but mechanical recycling usually leaves everything in the mix. Doesn't make the material better. But the act of removing it from the environment, which otherwise is impossible to afford, that is the positive impact. And then, the first investment we did at Palais Future Material, that's our new arm, um, 
was in the recycling of emissions. And we thought, it's such a stress, taking, scraping the beaches, scraping the communities, the rivers of plastic, while you can actually, theoretically, easily take carbon dioxide out of the air. Yes, you need some technology, but in comparison to the effort that it takes to, uh, to clean up uh, the planet from plastic waste, it's relatively easy to organize. It's a tech solution versus a very heavy manpower um, uh, solution when it comes to plastic interception. Air Company um, found a way to turn CO2 into rocket fuel, into jet fuel, into vodka, into fragrances. And you can say, oh yeah, but then it's going back into a pollution form. And yes, that's correct. In some cases, not with the vodka, our body absorbs it. But uh, <laughs> we being the whale or the tree ourselves, um, actually the Russians love I'm not sure I can say Russian anymore, but the Russians loved it when I had my last workshop with, um, in Boston with some scientists there. They were like, oh, we also thought that. We drank it all up. Um, the truth is, it's a step in between because, and they ha we have a first offtake agreement with the uh, Defense Department in America, um, very peaceful, I know, um, to actually run fighter jets on that stuff, 100% drop-in. That means... That's the best form of recycling, actually. You, you cut the dependency on, uh, on, on, on oil by recycling what is already there. And then, of course, the total opposite of all that synthetic stuff and all the pollutants is to collaborate with nature. And there is a very easy form to do that, an old, a vintage, an ancient way of collaborating with nature that is harvesting nature. Um, so the second big investment that we did was in a company called Bananatex, which actually is reforesting um, in the moment, areas in, uh, in the Philippines mainly, working with local um, farmers. And these are biodiverse little forests that actually bring life back into the soil. And they are um, diverse, uh, biodiverse forests, they're not like monoculture. Um, and the offsprings of that plants can be used to, uh, to make fabric, right? So next time, hopefully, you're going to see me not in a plastic jacket, but in a banana jacket. Um, not yellow, though. It will be black. Um, and then you go a step further, and that is something you probably heard about already, um, is collaborating with the organisms that actually make all these things. And now we're looking at ourselves. Look at our, I, I have like, I cut myself over the weekend when I tried to be a gardener, and this cut healed pretty much well over like two days. I mean, if I cut my jacket with the same knife, I mean, that will not heal. <laughs> I can wait for years and it will not heal, right? So that is dumb material. It's dead, dumb material. It's not healing. While the skin is super intelligent. The creatures in my skin, they're actually doing that. Like uh, the same guys or other guys, but also organisms that grow hair, that grow uh, uh, eye leashes, that grow fur. Okay, that's a big one, but still, that grow meat. So why not collaborating with them? So we invested in like, seven synthetic biology, they call it, but technically it's biofabrication companies that identify creatures that can grow things. What you're seeing here is concrete grown by little creatures that usually grow corals. They, um, they create pretty much the same stuff that you would see when you dive a coral reef or when you visit an island. Um, because these islands, are, especially in the Maldives and places like that, they have been grown by these little creatures. That concrete works for buildings, for runways, for everything. It's a perfect example of how to actually use organisms from nature to, um, for, um, for alternatives. First of all, I would ask ourselves to not anymore think about packaging. Only always think about product. Especially in a time where we order stuff and it comes to us at home, um, the idea of a product being different than its packaging is an outdated one. It's all the same experience. And some products are just, or some packaging of products, are the product. A plastic bottle is not a packaging, it's the product. So why not invent a new product? Why not create products that we actually want, that actually are smart, that are living in a year 2023, and they're not coming from 1950, 1960, 1970? Or we go back to that time because back then we had a better product design. We can also admit that. But I think, in general, splitting between product and packaging is a mistake. As a designer, 
we should think, A, about the overall experience and tossing a lot of styrofoam and tossing a box that has no use is not a good product experience anymore. You feel guilty. You spend, let's say, $1,000 for a new iPhone and you feel guilty about that because the old one was okay. Sorry. Yeah? And if it is scratched and you send it in, you get a new one or you repair it. it the old iPhone was great. You just want to have the newest one. That's already a guilty moment, okay? And then you toss all that other stuff that makes you feel double guilty. It actually puts it in your face how dumb you are. So as a designer, we want to actually not make people feel guilty when they're, of course, very guilty often. We don't want to rub it into our noses. We want to make it a, an experience where we feel great about it. So probably I use it as a box later. I mean, there are a lot of very silly reusable packaging forms as well. But I just want to say, in some cases, packaging is not the answer, it's the product itself. You know, we shouldn't have plastic bottles, for example. They should just not exist. Even this bottle that I brought is outdated, right? We should have this nice that you put on stage. It's great to put it on stage. Um, this is a great bottle. You know, tap water in New York is fine. In worst case, you use a filtration system. But there are other products where we simply don't need packaging and where the product is probably just dumb. So yes, design. And when you're taking the air strategy with avoid, intercept, and redesign, and you're applying that to packaging, then yes, we should avoid packaging. Every piece of packaging is a loss. You know, we just don't need packaging. We need products, smart, intelligent products. And look at the beer bottle, refill bottle. Anheuser Busch InBev, we convinced them to go totally away from one-way bottles for their brand Corona, they're making a shitload of money because they're refilling these bottles. And they, we found a way to actually make it cool that when you can see that the, 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 the glass is getting a little blind because there's some other textures that come out that show you how often the bottle was recycled. And it's actually, you're proud when you're seeing a little bit of a milky glass because you're like, you know what, that's cool. This bottle was in circulation for a while. That's very, very cool. It has patina. So, Avoid packaging, intercept toxic packaging. We can't just look away and say, oh, we're thinking about the future, and the future is amazing, while out there, animals are dying of that old packaging that we made, and we are actually ingesting it all itself. You know, it comes through, actually, even through the ears. We're getting <laughs> the plastic into our ears. I mean, and of course, the mouth, the nose, and all of that, and the skin, probably. And the next thing is redesign product, redesign product, redesign product. Make it intelligent, make it future-proof. That is a future-proof packaging. Super intelligent packaging. And I have not seen anyone on this planet, non -human, uh, not a human person, I've seen non-human people like these guys, but human people have not created such a packaging. It has everything life needs to start all over again. And once you don't need the husk anymore, it's perfect fertilizer or it can be a building block for something else. That is intelligent packaging. So, as a designer today, what is your role in an organization? It's not anymore to make things nice and pretty. It was never that, actually. The role of a designer today is to be a collaboration enabler. And to be honest, there's nothing stronger than a great design. You can have the best Excel sheet. You can be an Excel sheet acrobat. Yeah, you can be the best finance, Excel sheet acrobat, if you don't have anything to show, if you don't have a product, you can't convince anyone. So product, design, communication is design. Actually, culture of an organization is design. The identity, the brand, the true brand, I'm not talking logo, I'm talking the identity and the cultural definition of an organization is design. So I think designers today, quoting Marshall McLuhan, he actually said artists, but still, you can actually use that for designers, have to go out of the ivory tower into the control center of society. And society in this case means all these micro-bubble organizations which we call entities. And designers can actually, and have, we have done it right now with Dior at LVMH, we have done a 10-year jump is what they say. Because a designer, uh, two weeks ago, I was with Kim Jones in a media event, and design and environment spoke about the future of the brand. Suddenly, all the environmentalists, all the sustainable people in the company are seen totally differently. Because the moment the designers step up and free themselves from this 
prison they have been put in for a long time, you know, of not being relevant when it comes to business, is wrong. Because we designers are creating business. We are creating the values. And that is the truth. Without a product, a company has nothing to sell. And I'm not limiting it to designers. I can actually go further and say the coders, the inventors, the scientists. Let's just call it the creative industries. Cultural change needs to be driven in organizations. Otherwise, the new doesn't even have a soil to grow in. You can have the best ideas, the best innovations, the best product concepts. If your organization doesn't allow, doesn't give space for new, and gets in the position to even take a risk, because risk taking sounds great, but bungee jumping or jumping off a cliff or all that stuff, that's a silly risk. A good risk is actually when you are, when you know your odds. And a design can do things that every rationale cannot ever justify. A great design sells the most impossible stuff. And we have that, seen that with, back to Apple. We're buying overpriced products forever, yeah? Because we love the design. And then that comes to identity change. Sometimes it helps to actually, and there is a very thin border between greenwashing and vision. Sometimes it helps to say, this is what I want to be tomorrow. And this is my ambition. And you know what? I'm going to take risk here on a reputational level. And if people call me a greenwasher, come on, let's speak in five years again. If I lose my breath as an organization, they're right. But if I change my organization, then I was right. And I just changed my organization by speaking out loud and saying, I don't want to be a polluter. Which brings us back to that AAA meeting we can learn so much from. Thank you. Thank you.